Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this webinar on electric mobility, decarbonising the transportation sector. I'm Anna Watson, Head of Conference Production at Climate Action. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to welcome so many listeners to this afternoon's webinar. We've received over 800 registrations, so it's a bit of a full house, and a testament to the excellent speakers we have participating and the importance of the subject area. Please be aware that the session is being recorded and a link will be emailed to you shortly after the webinar is complete, so you'll be able to listen again and share with your colleagues if you wish. Just to let you know a little bit about Climate Action, for the last 10 years we have worked in a unique partnership with the UN Environment Programme to develop their official publication and events. This is with the aim of establishing partnerships between the public and the private sectors to accelerate green economic growth. Today's webinar takes place ahead of the 7th Annual Sustainable Innovation Forum, UNEP's official event during COP22 in Marrakesh on the 14th and 15th of November. The forum will unite 750 delegates, including environment ministers, investors, private sector organisations, mayors, UN bodies and many more to discuss the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Speakers currently include Minister Hakim, Hakim al Haiti, high-level COP22 champion, Bertrand Picard, pilot of the Solar Impulse Flight, Andreas Klugerstjid, Head of Steering Governmental and External Affairs and Sustainability Communications for the BMW Group, Siti Nabaya Bakar, Minister of Environment and Forest for Indonesia, and Christian Grossman, Director of Climate Change for the IFC World Bank. So please do visit COP22.org for more information and to download the full agenda. Which brings me on to today's webinar on electric mobility. With the transportation sector accounting for 23% of all global carbon emissions, the industry needs to embrace rapid decarbonisation if the aims of the Paris Agreement are to, are to be met. Electric vehicles are now just one of the technologies needed to accelerate this sustainable transition, whose popularity and dissemination is now on the rise, with sales nearly 50% higher than this time last year. Over the next hour, we will explore the following questions around EV development. What are the current trends and good practice stories emerging from the EV sector? What remain the key barriers to scaling deployment? And how are different sectors and organisations working together to facilitate this transition? And I feel extremely privileged to welcome three excellent speakers um, to address this topic this afternoon. Firstly, we welcome Dr. Daniel Sperling, a distinguished professor of civil engineering and environmental science and policy and founding director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Sperling continues to hold the transportation seat on the California Air Resources Board that he was appointed in 2007 and serves as chair of the Transportation Research Board of the US National Academies. He is an international expert on transportation technology, fuels and policy with a focus on energy and environment and is widely cited in leading newspapers and news magazines. Daniel will be our first speaker, setting the scene on international EV uptake, uptake and the key policy bar barriers that remain. We are then joined by Dr. Thomas Becker, Vice President of Governmental and External Affairs at the BMW Group. In this position, Thomas supervises the, world, the worldwide representation of BMW Group's political interests, oversees the company's approach to integrating political topics into the product and business communications of the company, and also steers uh, sustainability communication. Thomas will discuss e-mobility from the private sector perspective, sharing with us the progress of BMW Group in the space. Finally, we are joined by Andrew Eastlake, Managing Director of the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, a public-private partnership working to accelerate a shift to low carbon vehicles and fuels whilst creating business opportunities in the UK. As MD, Andy has been integrally involved in the design and implementation of the latest accreditation schemes for both buses and HGVs, supporting the UK Department of Transport and Office for Low Carbon Emissions in stimulating the uptake of low carbon technologies. So Andy will be focusing on his UK experience, looking at road transportation more widely and how we can stimulate greater EV uptake. So each speaker will have around five to 10 minutes to present their views, following which we will open the floor to discussion from our listeners. Um, so you can submit your questions via Twitter using hashtag SIF16 or using the question box on the GoToWebinar bar uh, to the right of your screen. So please don't be shy. We've had a few questions through already, which is great. Um, we will try and get through as many relevant questions as possible in the hour time frame. And with that, I will hand you over to our first speaker, Dr. Sperling. Um, doctor, allow me to unmute you. And 
I'm going to hand you controls of the presentation. So Dr. Spelling there, the floor is yours. Thank you. So the first correction is I'm from ITS Davis, not ITS Berkeley, as it says on the screen. Um, so thank you very much. My role here, my goal is to frame the discussion for us as we go forward here. And how do I control the slides? There we go. All right, so I am going to just frame it, uh, present some trends, and just talk a little bit about some of the challenges. So the big picture is that electric vehicle sales, and when we, when, when we say electric vehicles, we generally include plug-in hybrids, and in the future we'll be including fuel cells, but these sales are increasing sharply. These are data through uh, 2015. There's been an uh, even steeper rate of increase in 2016. A big share of that increase is in China, but Europe is also increasing rapidly. The U.S. not so quickly going forward. But the the, one of the important points is we're still, even with these sales, even with the large increases, <clears throat> we're still at less than 1% of total global sales. Now, one of the factors that really gives a lot of encouragement is that the costs of batteries are coming down much faster than I think almost anyone anticipated. And this is uh, perhaps the most uh, sophisticated analysis that's been done. It shows the costs coming down <clears throat> from about $1,200 per kilowatt in uh, 2006 or so, now down to about 400 and even in some, in some markets, some companies are selling them below 300 now, and so it's expected to go down under 200 within a, within a few years. So this makes a big difference. How this will affect cost, the prices of vehicles is still uncertain because there's a growing sense that the vehicles need longer range to be commercially successful. So even as the battery costs are coming down, the automakers are putting larger batteries in the cars. And so now we're getting vehicles with 300 kilometer range, like the General Motor, the Chevy Bolt, and also the Tesla uh, that's coming out maybe in a year or two. And kind of to frame it just a little bit more, it does look like a promising future, but the reality is that om almost all the scenarios and studies that are done show that if we really are going to achieve the goals of something like an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050, uh, certainly in the transportation sector, it really does imply a transformation of the sector, that we will be moving to almost completely away from gasoline, petrol, diesel, to electric drive vehicles. And that's, so that's a very different story, different situation than what we face now, where we're at less than 1% of sales. Now, bringing it down to the nation state of California, my home territory, uh, we do have the, we are putting in place the regulations and rules to achieve that 80% reduction in the transportation sector, and importantly, to accelerate the transition to these electric drive vehicles. So we have a rule in place, the so-called zero emission vehicle mandate in California, been adopted by eight other states in the United States, and it, uh, it will lead to about close to a 15% market penetration in 2025 of, of new vehicle sales. And there are a whole slew of other poli policies and incentives being put in place to help in, uh, move it beyond that 15%. And the numbers there show just a, a really a scenario uh, of what it could be and what it, in 2050 and what it shows is that 
uh, we're looking at something in California roughly split between plug-in hybrids, battery electrics, and fuel cell vehicles, anticipating that the plug-in hybrids would have fairly big batteries and ranges of at least um, at least 30, well, at least 40 kilometers and probably more like 60 or 70 kilometers. And I'll, you know, I'll uh, comment that the story is really a, of moving towards this 80% reduction actually is a quite hopeful one because we do see the automakers making the massive investments in technology uh, on the conventional vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles, and sorry for these barbaric US uh, uh, units here of miles per gallon. But we're basically doubling our fuel efficiency from 2010 to 2025 in the US. Europe is doing something similar, China, Japan. So it's really the, the policies in place, the government, the industry is investing, and the transition will slowly be taking place to electric vehicles uh, as we go with this anticipation of something like about a 4% per year improvement in new vehicles. So the, bring it back to policy, a big, poli a, a big challenge is that as we adopt these regulations, CO2 standards in Europe and fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards in, in the U.S. and the zero emission vehicle mandate, we're basically telling car companies that they need to sell these vehicles, these advanced technologies, which are more expensive. And we, we're really running the risk, the problem that the market signals are getting out of alignment with these regulations. So we are going to have to focus on that somehow going forward. We can't tell car companies you've got to sell cars that customers don't want. And so somehow the, a big challenge is how to build that uh, customer market for, for these advanced vehicles, these electric vehicles. Another big challenge is we've ne we need to provide the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure for the electric vehicles and eventually the hydrogen. And this, the problem here is that the cost of building public stations, in most cases, there's no business model for it. And <clears throat> in the sense that it's hard to make enough money to justify the investment. So we're seeing all kinds of incentives and regulations and subsidies taking place and they're going to have to play an important role. Uh, in places like California and US where most people own their own homes, at least in the early years, that's where most of the charging will take place, but that's not a long-term strategy. And the third challenge that I just want to highlight is that in transportation, we are seeing real transformations taking place and I would note this is for the first time in many, many decades. We are seeing the uh, mobility services like Uber and a lot of other companies, demand responsive, app-based, microtransit companies, a lot of opportunities for using the information technology that, in ways we haven't. And then we have the automation of vehicles just starting. We have the electrification. The challenge is how do you bring these three revolutions together so that what we end up with eventually are automated vehicles with multiple riders uh, powered by electricity. That would be the ultimate uh, goal. And uh, so that was just my effort at framing this discussion. I look forward to uh, Thomas and, uh, and Andy and uh, further discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sperling, for that overview. Um, I'll just mute you. And our next speaker is Dr. Becker from the BMW Group, who will be zooming in on what the private sector have been doing from BMW's point of view. So, Thomas, just allow me to unmute you. And I just handed you the control of the slides, so the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, in this webinar. Um, great pleasure to share some ideas and observations uh, from a BMW perspective, which some of which resonates, I think, pretty strongly with what Dan has just been outlining. 
Oh, Dr. Becker, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Have you got um, the webinar and speaker in the background just because there's a little bit of echo at the moment? Uh, I'm not aware of that, I must admit, but, but uh, is it better now? Oh. No. Okay. Oh, Can you hear me <laughs> properly now? No, that's okay. That's okay. We'll just have to have a little bit of echo. That's fine. Carry on. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Actually, the echo also applies to myself. So, um, and the chart is not not reacting. Ah, here we are. Okay. So, uh, to start with, uh, the. Automotive industry at the moment is undergoing uh, what we call an iconic change, and it is not just one a driver of change, but it is uh, two of those who coincide. Uh, on the one hand, it is decarbonization, reducing CO2. Ein Teilnehmer hat das Gespräch vorübergehend verlassen. And uh, introducing uh, electromobility. The other side of the coin is connectivity, autonomous driving, and new mobility services. Uh, whereas one of these changes is predominantly driven uh, by regulators, the other one is actually driven uh, by technology. And both overlap and coincide at the moment, uh, which uh, uh, contributes to, let's say, the fundamental character of change that we see. Let me outline a little bit what the difference is between uh, the relationship between us as industry and our uh, regulatory and legislative framework. When you look at all the changes that uh, came about in the last 30, 40, 50 years, uh, if you look at passive safety, if you look at airbags, if you look at all the devices that were put in the car to reduce emissions, um, the setup was relatively simple. Uh, regulators addressed us as car makers. We had to implement the new technologies. Uh, it was obviously not needed that the customer would say, hey, and now I want a catalytic converter. This was not a demand thing. It was one that played exclusively on the supply side. All manufacturers in this industry were affected the same. Everybody had actually to do precisely the same things. Uh, and there was no need to stimulate demand for that, apart from maybe some uh, uh, fiscal incentives in order to get these technologies on the road a little faster. And finally, all of that was decided and done by national or, in the case of California, namely big regional government players. All of that changes if we look at the policies that define decarbonization. This is not only about a device that you screw under every car. It means actually fundamentally new and different products on the road compared to the ones we have today. Second, and I will come back to that in a moment, it is dependent on the collaboration between supply and demand side policies as Dan has been outlining before. We are thirdly absolutely dependent on infrastructure to be provided beyond the infrastructure that is needed for cars today. And very clearly, these developments reshape the competitive landscape by contrast to what we have been seeing before. I will not go into deeper into that, but let me just name that also if we look at connectivity and vehicle automation, the role of regulators is again a different one. Here it is about mitigating risks, about controlling, for example, the possibilities of hacking cars. It is about defining responsibilities in a new value chain. And also here we have a big change in the competitive landscape. And finally, and this is another, I think, crucial point uh, of this conversation, all of that is not just about national activity. What really makes the customer decide for a new technology or not do that is to a very large extent decided at local level. So the role of local governments and local stakeholders is a hugely more important one today than we are used to in the past. And fragmentation and differences of local policies, on the other hand, is a huge challenge we are facing in very many markets. So this is just a brief overview of where we are on electrification. We have on the one side vehicles which are defined by the electric drivetrain, that's the BMW i products, i3 and i8. And these are uh, our plug-in hybrids uh, with which 
we cover the entire breadth of segments in which BMW is present. We will add more models in the next years uh, to this setup, for example, also a mini plug-in hybrid, a fully electric mini to be launched uh, later on, and also a sports activity vehicle with fully electric drive. What is important, I think, is the fact that we have been upgrading range and battery capacity of the i3 by 50% uh, three months ago. That demonstrates that the pace of technology development in the field of batteries very clearly means that we need to make the customer benefit from improvements even within the life cycle of a car. So we do not change range and capacity only every seven years. We have to do this at much shorter intervals. And very clearly, most of our customers tell us we want more range for the same price uh, and are not asking for uh, give me a cheaper product. So we really want to motivate uh, uh, customers to go for electric mobility by making available vehicles with stronger technical performance. So we think we are on a successful path with our electric uh, products. Today in the world, and this is obviously a very general global figure, every 36 car is a BMW. So obviously we would like that to be more, but that's today's reality. If we look at the electric vehicle market uh, in the world, the thing looks a little different. Here, every eighth car is a BMW. So I think that demonstrates that we have a strong commitment uh, to making electric mobility uh, a success globally. But very clearly what we also see is that electrification is something that will not take off if no action in support of it is taken. We do not have a single market worldwide where uptake has been going beyond 1% in the absence of reliable and clear government policies on infrastructure and also on tangible benefits for the customer, be them of a fiscal nature, be they in the form of privileges on road usage, parking, and other aspects of uh, what defines the total cost of ownership of electric cars. So what you see very clearly on this chart is uh, government policy matters a lot indeed. So turning to the next chart, what we do beyond uh, our uh, uh, technology in the car, we seek to also broaden our offers in terms of services. What uh, I'm showing here is uh, the example of our reach now uh, car sharing or car service scheme, which was launched in Seattle in April this year. We have now expanded to Portland and will do more of that kind. Uh, it adds on to the uh, number of similar activities under the name of Drive Now in Europe, uh, which is car sharing, but not only car sharing. It also means that you, we would offer a choice, having a car that you drive yourself for a few minutes or having a car where, with a chauffeur picking you up. So also car sharing between peers in closed user groups, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing is one of those options that we want to use under this model. And with a view to what can we do not just as a car maker alone, but in collaboration with others, I think a good example is uh, from Copenhagen. Copenhagen is a city with a strong commitment uh, to electric mobility, uh, and this is actually the only place where we are operating a fully electric fleet of shared cars, 400 i3s, which are not operated by us, but which are operated by Arriva. Arriva is a company that belongs to the Deutsche Bahn, the German state-owned railway, and they are the operator of the Copenhagen public transport system. So with one uh, device called the Reisecord, uh, the users can pay for their tram or for the bus, and they can have car sharing with an electric BMW. So that shows that the old days where you had either public transport or individual mobility are over, that we see much more models between these two extremes which some of them, depending on the framework conditions that are created by city governments, can also lead to a faster uptake of electric mobility 
then it would just be the case in the established mode of the privately owned car. So with those ideas uh, and examples um, I finish and I'm happy uh, to, to hand over the mic and uh, the control of the charts. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Becker. That's a great overview. Um, I'll just pop you back on mute. Um, and I will now welcome our final speaker, Mr. Andy Eastlake. So Andy, I'm going to unmute you now and I'll hand you control. Thank you very much, very and, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, to uh, both uh, Dan and Thomas as well for some very good insights. And um, uh, in just a couple of slides, I will try to um, uh, uh, just sort of put the position from the UK uh, in terms of how we're approaching this uh, electric mobility challenge. Um, just for those that aren't aware of what the low CVP is, the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership. Um, I think the key word there is partnership. So we are a public-private group that brings all of the stakeholders around the table to try and identify how we can accelerate this shift to lower carbon vehicles and fuels, of which, of course, electric, uh, electrification is a key part, uh, and actually uh, stimulate the opportunities for business from that. Because uh, as, as uh, Thomas has highlighted, you know, the collaboration between industry and the policy makers is what will make this successful. Um, so we've approached this and, and we're helping to hopefully steer the agenda uh, for the electrification. Um, what uh, I'd like to do first is just to flag up that uh, we've, we've focused quite a lot on cars, but actually electrification and low carbon opportunities exist across the road transport sector. Uh, and certainly in the UK, which is the area that I can, I can speak for, um, we've got uh, not only electric, fully electric double-decker buses that you can see there, uh, and indeed full electric trucks now, uh, and we are also uh, actually now carrying out trials of electric autonomous vehicles. The, uh, the vehicle in the top right there uh, is, is a, a fully autonomous vehicle that is now on trial here in the UK. So there's a wide range of solutions and integrating those into the overall mobility system is one of the challenges. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the greatest opportunity is, is from electrification in terms of the long-term plan. Um, however, one of the key things, and just picking up some of the messages that, uh, that Dan and, and Thomas have flagged up, um, one of the key things is that the market will decide. We will not be able to force people to buy cars that, uh, that we are obliged to sell as manufacturers. Um, we have to make sure that the policies, the drivers, are very much in support of the trajectory of vehicles and mobility uh, solutions and choices that we want to make. And I think the UK is an interesting um, uh, example here. Um, I think one of the key things is that it's quite encouraging. We are now at about 1.5% penetration of our new car market of plug-in vehicles. Uh, and the term we use in, in, the, in the UK is, is ULEV, ultra low emission vehicle. Uh, and we have a, a definition for that. But essentially, it, it involves vehicles for which you have a, a plug on the end of them in some form. What's very interesting over the, uh, the period has been the, ch the shift from the battery electric solution, the pure BEV, the pure battery electric vehicle, um, which now, over the last year, the sales of those pure battery electric vehicles have actually been relatively flat at about 0.4% uh, uh, of the market. And the real growth that we've seen has been in the plug-in hybrid and range extended vehicles. Uh, and that is partly due to customer demands, customer reassurance about range and things, but it's also due to the policies that exist in the grant structures, the company car tax regime. Uh, and as Thomas highlighted, one of the biggest challenges facing the automotive market is getting consistency of those policy frameworks so that the same technologies are successful in, in different markets because it becomes very, very disruptive if you have to start to try and design uh, different vehicles for different markets uh, as an, at a national or, or even, as, as, as was mentioned, at a local scale. Um, but I think, um, you know, just to illustrate this point and to pick up on the, uh, on the BMW example, I think here in the UK over the last uh, six months, I think sales of the i3 
were dominated by the range extender model, um, uh, which and I think it was about something like three to one in terms of the ratio of sales over the battery electric one. However, uh, like Thomas, I would say that that will probably switch back with the uh, sudden dramatic increase in range from a battery electric vehicle. So these, these uh, sensitivities in the market are very, very subtle and, and can be influenced uh, quite quickly, uh, which again provides us with some challenges. Um, what I would like to do is to flag up here that actually we are looking at a, a very dramatic shift in the way that we select and develop our mobility uh, and this doesn't happen overnight it's actually decades of change that we tend to focus on and and the illustration I'm trying to make here is that actually over the last 10 years between around the, uh, the mid 2000s and, and currently really the challenge and the opportunity has been focused around the cost of these new technologies and trying to uh, trying to bring the cost down to be uh, to, to, to allow them to become mainstream products here in the UK now, uh, I perceive that one of the, uh, the primary drivers for electrification will actually be clean vehicles. Uh, the carbon agenda is, is clearly there and, uh, and, and, and carbon, carbon saving and carbon mitigation is certainly one of the things that's uh, focusing the minds of legislators here. But actually air quality and urban air quality is possibly higher in the psyche of the public and the decision to buy an electric vehicle may actually be driven far more by a clean air zone requirement, the, the ability to enter a low emission zone or a zero emission zone, or the desire to have a zero emission vehicle and the clean vehicles. Um, and I think the challenge uh, in the 2020s is actually going to be about making these new technologies a convenient form of transport. As was highlighted by a, a couple of the speakers, the infrastructure and making it um, and the natural uh, choice of, to buy an electric car uh, really relies not now on the technology but on the infrastructure and overcoming um, the, the perception of range and the time taken to charge and, and that I think will be the focus. Um, but beyond that, when we have got these to be mainstream, so in the mid-2030s, that is the time when we will actually see a reduction in the amount of fuel that we're burning, if this, this illustrates, the blue illustrates really the conventional fuel burning vehicles and the orange is the ULEVs, the, the electricity or, or fuel cell um, uh, combustion vehicles. So actually we don't make a material change to the amount of fuel until the sort of mid 2020s when the uptake starts to really ramp up and I think that's fairly consistent across the globe. Um, but in that last phase, in the last 15 years to 2050, if we really want to get to our 80% reductions, we've actually got to be thinking about changed mobility. And, uh, and Thomas has obviously highlighted some of that uh, in some of his presentation. The way that we're trying to focus on that and the way that uh, the UK and the low CDP is, is really to think about um, what I've called the four Ps. So we have the products, and those products, um, the electric, electric products, are improving. And as Thomas said, they have to improve almost within the life cycle of the vehicle because of the pace of change at the moment. But identifying the, the, the opportunities for those products is something that we're, we're, we're very much doing. But those products can only be successful in the marketplace if we have, number one, the right proof and the evidence and the assessment that they deliver what we want, the range that uh, consumers are wanting, that they've got a representative approach. Uh, it, won't, it won't come as any, um, any surprise to people that uh, obviously the, the emissions uh, d discussions over the last few years have really undermined some of the, um, uh, the, the data that uh, we produced from the automotive industry and actually getting that confidence back in, in, uh, in the emissions performance and of course the electricity consumption and range performance of vehicles is going to be a key thing. We also need the policies to support the right trajectory of mobility choices uh, and that can come in the form of grants and, and preferential access but clearly those are, are generally unsustainable long term uh, but obviously we need to prime the market and most markets as, as was illustrated by Thomas have some sort of support for the electrification agenda. And then finally one of the key elements is about the promotion, consistent promotion. So it's 
unless we've got the right evidence and the right policies in place and we're telling people about them and encouraging them to to actually engage with this um, the, uh, this, this data set um, that is actually one of the key things that will help the products become successful in the market and those are some of the activities that we're focusing on uh, here in the UK I think one last point that I wanted to flag up was that um, we've got some great electric buses um, but as I said in the long term one of the challenges is that we've got to think about mobility slightly differently um, and really consider that we don't really want to replace our double-deck electric bus that carries uh, 80 people with 80 autonomous electric vehicles taking individuals all around the city because we won't have achieved a low carbon mobility solution uh, if that's all that we actually um, actually get to so there is this need for us to progressively think about um, the the actual carbon per passenger kilometer in the long term rather than just on an individual basis the vehicle and the zero emission vehicle being the same uh, irrespective of how many people are in it so I think there is this long-term agenda that we need to consider uh, but I wouldn't suggest we uh, we need to grapple with that just yet I think at that point I'll hand back over and uh, and just uh, just thank uh, uh, thank thank Anna for arranging the uh, the conference uh, thank you Andy and thank you for that great presentation Okay, brilliant. So we're now at the discussion uh, phase of the webinar, so I'm going to unmute you all, if that's okay. So I've been frantically <laughs> trying to write down the questions we've been receiving through, so thank you, um, everyone. There seems to be sort of two um, main themes that are emerging. So one is very much around the supporting infrastructure for EVs. Um, so Dr. Sperling, you mentioned that there is no sort of business model at the moment around putting in charging points, um, in terms of who profits and who should be leading on this. Um, so I thought it would be quite interesting, um, Dr. Becker, perhaps to get the point of view from BMW um, as a private sector actor. Um, I mean, what are you doing to support um, sort of the, the infrastructure that's needed to charge your vehicles? And then Daniel and Andy, perhaps from kind of the municipal perspective, especially in California and the UK. Um, so what's been going on on the ground there? So very clear what we do is we offer to our customers um, a service package which if they want includes for example the installation of a charging wall box in their garages or at their workplaces so that they don't have the hassle of checking the capacity of the electricity lines and uh, having that done in a proper technical manner. Um, you can even have if you want a solar carport from BMW. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we are part of a number of uh, uh, projects in order to uh, get namely uh, fast charging uh, along the main traffic axles uh, uh, installed. So in Europe, this is done under the headline of the so-called uh, 10T projects, where we work uh, closely with um, infrastructure providers and namely many other car makers uh, to bring uh, charging infrastructure on the road very clearly we do not see this as a competition topic. This is not about differentiating charging of BMW from charging from Nissan, for example, but instead we are working uh, with other companies in pretty many markets uh, together in order to uh, ramp up the av availability of charging infrastructure in the public arena, acknowledging that this will not just work by waiting for somebody to, to do it alone. So it needs a concerted effort involving us, electricity providers, and obviously governments. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Daniel, I don't know whether you want to because it's come in from the perspective of California and what you've seen happening there. Well, I'll affirm what Thomas said. I think he's right. I mean, he's he's pursuing this idea that it's it's not a really an entrepreneurial opportunity for companies, and so. We need the automakers to play a role. We need the utilities and the governments to participate in this. And I think it's going to be very different everywhere. Um, you know, in California, we are working. At first, we prohibited the utilities from providing electricity, and then we realized that was a mistake. So now it's being open in there and being encouraged to do so. So the local electric utilities are going to be playing a big role. 
And we have a nice new little pot of money just created by Volkswagen that's going to be <laughs> devoting some money to it. So thank you, Volkswagen. Very kind. <laughs> um, Andy, from the point of view of London, I've seen a few EV charging stations around. Um, is it the same kind of story in terms of the partnerships that you've been creating um, with your yeah. organisation? Absolutely. I, mean, I, th I think the, the UK, the UK is um, really, you know, focusing on this as being one of the key barriers to uptake. Um, so, you know, the, the, the barrier to, to buying an electric car is not the electric car by any means. They work extremely well, but making sure the charging infrastructure is coordinated. As, as Thomas said, there is a, a very active European program. Uh, there's an alternative fuels directive, which is, uh, which is bringing into place standardization, both geographic and, and technical standards around, uh, around charging stations. Um, and, and I think making, you know, we, we like others see the, um, uh, the home charge uh, is, is the predominance for the current fleet of vehicles, but understanding how we provide a home charge solution for, for people who don't have a drive, and then also looking at uh, the solution for rapid charging out in the, in the, um, on the network. One of the, the situations, or one of the things that we're now getting into is a, uh, a grouping that we've created between the electricity and charging providers in the auto industry to think about the long-term challenges that this dramatic shift in electric uh, energy use will bring. Uh, we've done some pilot projects which look at um, the challenges of clusters of EVs on a street that may cause issues with the capacity of the grid and how we can potentially uh, manage the charging or send the right signals around when to charge up. Uh, and these issues, we're starting to think about them now before they become a problem uh, in the future because there will need to be, certainly in the UK, there will need to be some reinforcement of the grid to support the, the mass electrification of transport. I think the, the, far, the last point is that we mustn't forget the, the big fleets, you know, getting a fleet of buses to electrify in the centre of London and being able to charge all of those overnight uh, is a major undertaking uh, and that is one of the things that's holding back fleet electrification at the commercial vehicle level um, in terms of, of how we address those, those challenges too. Great, thank you Andy. Um, and I suppose a question building from looking at engaging the energy suppliers. Um, somebody has been asking about whether the, le the electricity will come from renewable energy resources, um, if there's any issue of kind of displacing, displacing the emissions from petroleum into kind of coal and gas-based um, fuels for electricity. Um, so Dr. Sperling, I don't know whether you'd like to maybe have a stab at that one. Um, is the efficiencies that you can gain from electric vehicles going to offset this anyway, even if it was from fossil fuels? Well, we are in a really important transition, historical transition away from petroleum. It's going to be a slow transition. The oil companies are going to resist because we're basically telling them that their business model is no longer acceptable and you can imagine they don't appreciate that. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of pushback. Um, and I think the oil industry does not see, have much interest in participating in electricity supply. They see it as a regulated industry, uh, a marginal, you know, low profit industry. And so they're not very interested in it. And so we're operating on two, in two different directions here two, in parallel. We're, we're bringing the electric vehicles in place. We're decarbonizing our electricity system while at the same time, the oil industry plays a slowly diminishing role and uh, it, it, that's going to, politically, that's going to be a challenge moving forward. No, definitely. Both the energy and the transportation um, transitions yeah, coming together, I think it's going to take quite a while, you're right. Um, Dr. Becker, actually, we've had some specific questions for you, so sort of leading on from this. So, um, Diego and Lawrence, they are wondering about um, EV deployment in areas where perhaps electricity infrastructure isn't as developed. So um, is BMW um, launching many projects in perhaps LATAM or other areas of Africa where perhaps the infrastructure isn't as strong? Are there any projects around those regions? 
I mean, very clearly, we are active, namely in those places where we have, let's say, significant presence as BMW. Ein Teilnehmer hat das Gespräch vorübergehend verlassen. Uh, if you look at uh, Africa, it is namely South Africa where we are collaborating with the government uh, at various levels on electrification. Uh, we have a long presence in South Africa, also manufacture vehicles there, so certainly here we seek to be part of the ramp up uh, of electric mobility. The same um, applies to Brazil, uh, where we also want to contribute uh, to, let's say, the first uh, ideas and initiatives to connect at least some of the major centers uh, with electric charging infrastructure. Um, so we do not offer EVs in absolutely all markets, but in the majority of them, and we reach very clearly the biggest part of the BMW customer base uh, with these offers. But it's also very clear that uh, lowering the threshold uh, to drive electrically works best in many places, and namely in rural areas, um, uh, with plug-in hybrids, uh, where you do not uh, uh, have this issue of range anxiety, which, although looking at the objective figures, may not be as much big as an issue, but it is perceived as such. So reality that you can measure is one thing. Customer perception and psychology is a different one. So we start where the, where the framework conditions are best, which is in urban areas and suburbs of larger cities, and where we see the demand picking up strongest but we very clearly want to enable as many customers as we can to drive electrically. But it will not go forward at the same pace everywhere. That is also part of the reality, I think. Could I, could I add this, Dan? You know, perhaps the most key market in place will be China as we go forward. It's not a very low income. It's more of a middle income now. But the government is making a massive commitment through subsidies, uh, they they look at it both in terms of air pollution reduction as well as developing their own leapfrog automotive industry. But they the the Chinese companies are the largest producers of, of electric electric vehicles now, and there's a lot of subsidies. They're adopting actually a zero emission vehicle mandate similar to California's uh, for the country. So I think we really need to keep an eye very closely because they on China because they can not only develop a big market there, but develop a, an industry that's very aggressive about uh, these electric vehicles. It'll probably be lower cost, simpler electric vehicles than what BMW and other major automakers, international automakers will do, but nonetheless could play a, a very transformational role. Great, thank you, Daniel. Okay, um, so, I'm going to try and smash through as many questions as we can. So we've also had um, quite a lot of inquiries around the social aspects um, and kind of getting people to uptake, um, which we've all discussed, um, you've all discussed in your presentations. So obviously we can control the technology development and the policies that are put in place, but impacting people's behaviour is obviously much more challenging. Um, so we've had a question on Twitter from Michael Delange. So he's from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And he was commenting that they are looking to move towards um, car sharing. However, low, low uptake is one of the main hurdles. So, I mean, Daniel, you mentioned that I think it was 15%. Um, you're hoping for 15% EV uptake in California by 2025. It'd be interesting to kind of learn more about who you expect these people to be um, and kind of the promotional tools that you're going to adopt in the runner. Um, and I suppose it would be interesting as well to hear back from um, Thomas and Andy in terms of your experience in, um, was it um, London and also Copenhagen? So I'll, I'll just say, it, 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 in many ways, for those of us very enthusiastic about these vehicles, it's, it's r frustrating how slow the market is developing. In California, the, many of the cars are available at, at $100 uh, per month lease rate. I mean, this is not much more than a smartphone, and and even with that, we we're only at three percent in California. We're about at three percent market share right now. Um, people are resistant, and I think we need a much more sophisticated and concerted effort to educate people, to give them the experience, the idea of 
uh, having electric vehicles in car sharing or in new mobility services is a really good one as a way of exposing people to this. But most people have very little sense of, even in California where we're aggressively promoting them, large incentives, they still, most people really are not very aware, frankly, of electric vehicles. We've seen sur our own surveys at UC Davis have shown that and others. So I think, you know, just a very simple statement, but really powerful, important is the chat, the focus now has to be on how to develop the market. The technology is pretty much there. The car companies are making the investment. They're developing the vehicles, but people are not buying them at the rate that we'd like to see. Well, if I, if I may add to that, I mean, what, what we see uh, looking at car sharing is that really this lowers the threshold to actually try out uh, that new technology. So uh, uh, you don't have to go to a showroom, you can just try it if you are a member of a car sharing scheme. Another fact that has been underscored at least by the data we have been seeing from the car sharing projects we are operating in London, in Munich, in, in Berlin and other places is that a shared car does not replace a new BMW for example. It replaces a 10 to 12 to 15 year old used car which would otherwise stand around in uh, central city areas for 90% of its time and usually on average has way worse emission characteristics than new vehicles. So uh, having an electric car used in a shared mode in terms of absolute emissions avoided certainly has the biggest possible leverage. On the other hand, if you have no charging infrastructure and the car uh, has to be driven around uh, from the place where the last user has dropped it uh, to a charging post, being charged and brought back into, for example, the, range, the area of operation, uh, very clearly makes it, makes it way more expensive to operate than a conventional one. So therefore, ramping up municipal charging infrastructure, integrating that with sharing schemes, for example, offers huge opportunities to get the oldest and dirtiest vehicles off the road relatively fast. And I think it's worth also putting some uh, stronger efforts at municipal level uh, uh, into this. And uh, this is what we work on with very many uh, cities in which, uh, in which we operate. Thank you, Thomas. Andy, I don't know if you have anything to offer from the, the London case study. Um, I think, um, I mean, in the UK, uh, London is slightly unique in the way that its, uh, its mobility is, is serviced because it has a very uh, good and convenient public transport system. And so car ownership, uh, personal car ownership has actually gone down in London. Uh, whereas across the rest of the UK, it's, uh, it's certainly not been going down. And, and overall sales in the UK are, are still increasing. I think, um, I think there's, there's been a couple of really good points made. We, we're, trying to, we're trying to change several things for the, the current consumer of uh, a car or purchaser of a car. We're trying to get him to buy a, a, a zero emission cleaner car and to change the way he, he refuels that and, and thinks about that, that process. Um, but long term, we're wanting him to wean him off owning a car at all, really, uh, and trying to get to this shared mobility model. Um, so these are some pretty big changes, which is why I think we've got to think about it in a in a sort of 30-year time frame. So um, certainly, uh, personally, I'm a great believer in the the range extended solution, where you're maximising the use of electricity but you're removing any excuse for not buying one because it can be used, and, and, the, and the i3 is a, is, a, is a great example of that, it can still be used and, and driven continuously, um, but you're actually doing the, the vast proportion of your of mileage on, uh, on electricity. And, and that is, you know, I really see that as one of the key enablers to getting mass uptake, um, uh, because even with 200 mile range batteries, there are challenges in, in refueling those at the speed that people are used to. And whether they need that is, is another question entirely. But, but trying to take people to make a step backwards from what they've been used to for many years is quite a challenge. Um, and I think you know, it's going to be a long game in terms of the, the change to a shared mobility. And that is going to need 
a lot of public um, uh, um, policy support and long-term uh, nudging, if you want to call it that, to actually move us to a, to a and this is very much a societal change, the way that we buy our mobility. Um, I see that that being the, the primary revolution in mobility, not driverless vehicles or I think those are evolutions, but the revolution is about how we buy the way we travel. Great, thank you Andy. Um, I've had a few questions about battery technology, so it seems I can kind of group them together um, by sort of asking, um, perhaps I'll address this to you Thomas, um, in terms of the battery improvements that are being made, is this research being driven by companies like BMW? Are these coming out of universities? Um, so to where are these technologies coming from? Um, and could there be perhaps scope for the future if the technology is developing so quickly that BMW could upgrade, um, upgrade their cars that are already with existing consumers? Well, we are for the i3, we, we offer the uh, possibility of upgrading Ein the old battery uh, by the new one. Um, but uh, what we clearly see is battery technology will improve. Uh, and we collaborate with uh, scientific institutions in order to understand the chemical, the chemistry of that. Uh, but very clearly the batteries sell as such, we see as a supply product. Uh, we ourselves focus on the battery as a component, so we seek to master everything that is transforming electric energy uh, into driving behavior. So the management of the battery, the interaction with the drivetrain, the, we make the motors ourselves. So this is where we see our core competency less than uh, in the field of uh, actually the battery cell in the narrow sense of the device that holds the electricity. Sure. So you're working with many other institutions in terms of integrating that into your products? Yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we've had a specific question around hydrogen infrastructure as well. So Patricia Mayer from HiSci Labs, I believe it's pronounced, um, she's commented, obviously we're looking at electric infrastructure, we're also looking at hydrogen vehicles. Um, is there a conflict of interest here? Um, Andy, I don't know whether you could address that question. Um, I, I, I think, uh, no, there isn't a conflict of interest. Um, there's certainly, for the long range, uh, hydrogen is seen as one of the, uh, the key enablers. Um, I think in the passenger car market, um, there, there, it, it will be an interesting uh, discussion about where the role that hydrogen plays in that, uh, given where battery technology is, is moving uh, and the potential for very fast uh, charge rates into high, capa high capacity batteries, um, but in the uh, in the heavy duty market, there is a need for a, a higher um, uh, energy capacity on board, and I think hydrogen has a play in there. Hydrogen clearly is a a, 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 a very useful way of uh, storing um, intermittent energy from uh, electric, uh, but but th there is this this um, tension between whether a battery or a uh, hydrogen uh, storage solution uh, is actually going to be the, the right one in the very long term. Um, but I think one of the key things is that from a policy perspective, hydrogen is embedded into the policy thinking and is part of all of the directives and the direction that we are taking in developing an infrastructure for the different alternative fuel solutions that, uh, that are in play at the moment. This, this is Dan. So I own three, three zero emission vehicles, a hydrogen Mirai from Toyota, a Tesla, and a, bat, and a bicycle. My bicycle is the favorite, but, but I just say that because I think we need to be looking at this as we need both of these solutions, both electricity and hydrogen. Hydrogen will tend to be used more in the bigger vehicles, like uh, light-duty trucks and the larger SUVs, the, uh, the heavier, medium-duty trucks, heavy-duty trucks, because they're better suited for those longer ranges. There's greater energy density. So, um, but we need to make, let this play out. But I think we need to make sure that all of these options, but the plug-in hybrids, the, the BEVs, and the fuel cells, all are receiving strong 
certainly policy support and, and let the industry and the market figure it out. That's great. Thank you, Dan. Um, we've actually just about run out of time, I'm afraid. Um, if I just don't know whether we've got time for a few closing remarks. Um, I think we can sneak some in. I mean, I don't know whether you'd um, perhaps mind just with COP22 coming up, um, just giving your sort of key takeaway to the policymakers that will be there. Um, if you could let them know one thing around accelerating electric vehicles, what would you like them to do within the next few years before the next COP? <laughs> um, start with Dan. <laughs> I, I think we need to get electric vehicles totally in the mindset. Um, that this is a transition that's taking place and it's global, it's already happening, but it's, it, needs, it, it, it needs what we call a bull, bully pulpit as much as anything. It mean, needs our leaders saying this is the future, getting people comfortable with it and as a way of developing it. And I, one topic we never discussed here that is, it, I hate to say it, anything depressing, but low oil prices, which are likely to continue for a long time, are going to make all of this a lot more difficult. And that needs to help. We need to sharpen our minds on how to deal with that. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Thomas, any closing remarks? Well, I mean, if you look at Europe, for example, we have markets where we have a two-digit percentage share of electric vehicles uh, of BMW sales. We have other markets in Europe with two-digit uh, sales in absolute numbers, and I'm talking low digit, two digit here. Um, so what I think would be good to see is more alignment uh, between governments uh, and on having consistent, reliable, and transparent support policies, uh, making the current uh, fragmentation a little bit uh, less uh, problematic than it is at the moment. So a toolbox that would converge between at least major regions and players worldwide uh, would help. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and Andy, perhaps you can round things up for us. I'll, I'll certainly try. I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> number one, I think we're at a very exciting time. There are some excellent technologies available, and they're available and in reach of uh, let's call it the common man, you can buy a really effective electrically powered vehicle right now and operate it very effectively. I, I would support uh, Thomas in that what we haven't got is a globally consistent um, framework of, of policy and trajectory that really forces national policies to move in the right direction, whether that's a, a sort of structured carbon taxation so that you're you're really you know, plowing into the direction that we're taking um, and the more consistent that can be globally, nas nationally and locally, um, the greater the opportunities for economies of scale and, and the general sort of uh, population to understand where we have got to go and, and, and it is an inevitability um, and so giving that clarity of direction uh, and supporting that with robust policy I think will will really help us um, uh, across the globe. Thank you, Andy. That was very nicely round off there. I um, very much appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's a shame we didn't get to address um, carbon taxes, um, but sadly we are out of time. Um, so yes, I'd very much like to thank um, Daniel Sperling, Thomas Becker, uh, and Andy Eastlake for joining us this afternoon. Um, and just to remind you all that the podcast of this webinar will be available very shortly, so that will be emailed straight to your inbox. Um, Thank you. Have a lovely afternoon, and I look forward to potentially seeing you at COP22. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.